Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Fields. I'm a chiropractor. Welcome to Health and Care. I have a great friend of mine, and he's over all the time. And I, he was talking about this hair thing. I mean, I always figured my buddy would just end up bald, and um, my my kids would have a bald godfather. And, uh, and but you know, he started doing this thing, and I didn't really pay much attention to it. And then one day, I looked at him. It was about a year, maybe fourteen months into his thing, and I went. I said, man, what is going on? I go, your hairline is almost to where mine is. And you've had some major changes here. And uh, it, it was kind of a mind blower. And so he talked about this guy, Rob English, right? Well, there's this guy and he, I heard him speak and I did his program and, da, 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 and I went, I went, oh my gosh, I need to talk to this guy. So this guy is right up our alley, right? I try and bring things to you that are all about self-care. You hear me all the time say self-care is high quality, hands-on healthcare. Well, Rob is a medical editor. He has has uh, published five studies. He's, he's, he's into the allopathic side and he's into the non-allopathic side. He's just has an open mind, went to Berkeley. And Rob, good to see you. Good to connect. Thanks for having me. Right on. I make sure did my did my hair for you. Um, oh, it's looking really nice. Thanks, man. <laughs> so, um, so how does a guy, you know, an economics major from Berkeley, end up getting like people like Vin Diesel and and Joe Rogan or Rogan to go to you know Fabio uh, with with you know some of the techniques you're recommending? Well, full disclosure, I haven't worked with Vin Diesel or Joe Rogan. Um, <laughs> but uh, the story happens all unintentionally. So I never had any interest in hair loss research whatsoever until I actually started noticing that my hair was thinning out. And that was around 15 to 16 years old. So I was getting comments from other people at school. And I was thinking, Oh, this is Ooh. probably not the best thing to be dealing with at such an early age. How old were you? And so I booked an appointment with the leading doctor and hair loss specialist in New England at time. And he took me into his office, did a scalp examination, brought out a dermatoscope, which is this magnifying glass where you, you look into the follicles themselves to look for evidence of things like hair diameter diversity, thicker hairs versus thinner hairs, the number of resting to shedding to growing hairs. And he told me that I was suffering from early stage male pattern hair loss, also known as androgenic alopecia. Mm. And that it's this chronic and progressive condition and that without treatment, it usually worsens and that it would be best to start treating it as soon as possible. And so at that appointment, he prescribed me this drug finasteride. He told me to start using this topical called minoxidil twice daily. And then he also recommended me into trying a low level laser therapy in clinic trial as part of his office. Uh, and I ended up paying for that as well. And when I got home that night, I started to think to myself, well, what what causes hair loss? What's going on with hair loss? Why do we lose our hair? Why do some people not lose their hair? Mm. How and old I started are you at the time? Into... How old are you at the time? I, I was 17. During 17. The time of the, uh, That's got to be a bloat yeah. your psyche yeah. right there. I mean, come on. Yeah, as a junior in high school. So oh. it, it felt really socially and psychologically isolating in many respects because to my knowledge, nobody else that I knew was going through the same thing as me. Or at least if they were, they hadn't been talking about it. And uh, for guys... And for women especially, hair loss is uh, kind of like your own battle to face. It's something that you don't like to talk about. It's something that, um, you know, the stigma around it is changing now with some of the bigger brands like Hims and Keeps and Romans that are making it okay for people to celebrate that they're losing their hair and that there are effective treatment options out there. But mm -hmm. back in 2007, it was a different ballpark. And so right. uh, it was also a different ballpark online. And so the first thing that I did was I started to look into some of these medications that was prescribed to me. So first being finasteride. Finasteride is this drug that lowers a hormone known as dihydrotestosterone or DHT for short. It's a testosterone metabolite. And um, it's one of those male hormones that seems to be really critical for early stage male development. And then its importance diminishes in adulthood. I was 17 years old and I started to read some of these horror stories online about the side effect profiles and it just really scared me away from trying this because on Google, you usually have these anecdotes that rise to the very top. The more sensational the article, the more clicks it's going to get, the crazier mm. the headline, the more people are going to read. 
And so that was the first exposure to information that I had about this drug. And it absolutely terrified me. I wanted to be a, a competitive athlete in college. I had no idea what would happen if I started to reduce this hormone this early on. When right. It has to, to be doing continue. something good in your body, right? I mean, what sexual function, reproduction, muscle strength? I mean, what testosterone seems like an important people take testosterone because they think it's a good thing. Yes, exactly. And so I just was really nervous to start this drug that in my eyes seemed to be causing all these problems for people and that those were the first things that I saw on my Google search. And mm. so at this point in my life, I wasn't scientifically literate. I didn't know how to read a clinical study. I didn't know the importance of randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials, the hierarchy of evidence. There's all these things that I didn't know. And so as a consumer, you read this and you think, I, I can't take it. And so I didn't. And instead, I stuck with the things that were purported to work through non-hormonal mechanisms. So for me, that was low-level laser therapy. Mm. You use these helmets and these diodes. And for me, I went into a clinic as part of a clinical trial sat under these laser lights for a few times every week to see if my hair counts would change. Mm. And then I also use twice daily minoxidil. Minoxidil is one of these drugs that we actually don't know how it works. It was originally formulated as a blood pressure lowering medication. You take it orally. Mm -hmm. And then people who were taking this orally reported that they were getting hair growth all around their body. And so it was reformulated as a topical right. and then went through FDA approved trials and became approved for use uh, as a topical agent for androgenic alopecia. But the mechanisms of action are still unknown to this day. So mm. it's a vasodilator. It can open blood flow and circulation and oxygen levels to the scalp. It's a potassium ion channel modifier. It has mm -hmm. prostaglandin modulating activities. Those are fatty acid derivatives involved in inflammation. Um, but nobody really actually knows. They don't exactly know the mechanism. It it's minoxidil. Or yes, it's minoxidil. minoxidil. Okay. Yeah. And so I figured no known mechanisms, but not hormonal. I'll go with that. And then I did the low level laser therapy trial and I was constantly thinking to myself, oh, you know, if I give this a little bit of time, I'll probably see some results. Mm -hmm. so six months happened, the trial ended. I didn't see any improvements whatsoever from the laser clinic. Then I went to laser combs like Hairmax, started using those and continued to use Rogaine twice daily. That's the brand name of Minoxidil, the one mm -hmm. that I was using at the time and just continued to use it. And then six months turned into a year, turned into two years, three years. I ended up using Minoxidil for six years. And unfortunately, I was one of those individuals who was just a non-responder to the medication. Mm. And all the while, I was panicking. And like most consumers facing this condition do, when they run into that scary information about finasteride, you start to go down the rabbit holes of buying different products and hoping that the next natural intervention that you buy, the, the supplement, the topical, the device, is going to be the one that actually works to regrow your hair. Right, right. And Again, meanwhile, you're had... freaking, you're, you're baptizing your hair every day with this you know, potion, and you're like, this is supposed to work, come on, and you're looking, you're taking photos, um, 2008, right, iPhones coming out, okay, what's happening up there, <laughs> and nothing's happening, and, uh, and what's going through your head, I mean, are you, are you looking at yourself psych psychosocially in a way, too, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to be 25 and bald? Well, that was the concern because at that initial doctor's appointment, the prognosis is over the next five to 10 years, this is going to become significantly cosmetic for you. And the options for you at that point are going to be a hair transplant unless you can get it under control with the treatments of today that are available. Mm -hmm. And so there was certainly an element of panic. I was fortunate in some senses, though, because my hair loss started really rapidly mm -hmm. and then after going up like this, began to creep and continue to get worse. But it wasn't necessarily one of these problems where it was continuing at the original pace that it accelerated. Mm -hmm. So my eyes, minoxidil, maybe these low level laser therapies, they helped to slow it down a little bit, but I wasn't seeing improvements. And there's photos on my site where you can see specific parts of my scalp where I just wasn't seeing the density increases that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I was in this position where it was continuing to become chronic and progressive despite seeking some of these approved treatments and it was making me really nervous. And so when I got to college, I realized that 
part of being at a university like Berkeley allows you to have these subscriptions to all these medical and scholarly journals. And oh, nice. so you don't have to pay anymore or face a paywall to get access to great information. Mm. This was in 2008. And so now you have devices that can sidestep some of those scholarly journal paywalls. But back then, if you weren't paying, there was no way that you could access that information. And so I began to read these medical journals and the, the premise for me was if I can't control this condition from getting worse, at least I'll have some solace in knowing that I understand it at a higher level. And that forayed into my research interests overall on hair loss disorders. And I found the topics absolutely fascinating, despite not studying it at all professionally or, um, or academically in college at the time. And so that continued to grow over time. And I realized that there are all these interesting facets of hair loss pathology that um, were really puzzling researchers, but that weren't necessarily getting communicated to consumers at a, at, at a doctor's office who were facing hair loss problems. And I also realized that during my own fight for hair loss, I was making so many mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't abiding by things like results horizons to understand the minimum amount of time a treatment would need to be applied to actually have an effect and then the maximum amount of time where new results from that treatment become unlikely. And when I was hopping from these natural products to natural products, they all actually contained mostly the same ingredients. So I was trying the same mechanisms of action over and over and over again, mm -hmm. hoping for a different result, which is basically the definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. And yet you're desperate as a consumer. You're trying to fix this problem that psychologically in many ways is kind of taking control over you. Mm -hmm. And so I developed a, a really keen interest overall on the topic. I felt like I had a marginal degree of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and around 2012, 2013, there was some mechanistic evidence coming out from murine models and in vitro studies demonstrating that mechanotransduction, this field where you would deliberately create mechanical tension or pressure mm -hmm. on specific tissues, could elicit wound healing responses. And those wound healing responses had mechanistic signaling protein and growth factor overlap with the exact pathways that are required for hair growth. These are things like WNT signaling and beta catenin or VEGF, or even um, potentially the modulation of blood, oxygen, and um, other factors that are associated with the balding process, which we can get into later. So you're, you're talking about almost like a, a a wound healing process or something like that. Exactly. And so during this period, we were seeing evidence about microneedling eliciting these effects in some respects. There were studies that were coming out showing that microneedling alongside the usage of minoxidil could amplify the effectiveness mm. of minoxidil by mm. 400%. Just to let everybody know, I brought this. This is a little, little microneedle here. How many, how many needles do you think? These are what, I don't know, what do you do, like 0.5? millimeter or something like that or how deep do you go we just published a study on these so we did a systematic literature review on all of the studies ever published about uh humans and hair loss disorders and microneedling and essentially the best needle lengths for rollers are believed to be around one to 1.5 millimeters oh that's a, so that that's a good one yeah yeah, so that that confers with not the same penetration depth. So when you use a roller, there's user pressure variability and the angulation of the needle entry changes. So you actually only hit about 0.6 to 0.8 millimeters into the skin. So you break Got that it. epidermal layer that's 0.4 millimeters and very avascular. Mm. And you puncture into the dermis, which is vascularized. So you can get a little bit of pinpoint bleeding. Right. But the hair follicle stem cell bulge resides about one millimeter to 1.8 millimeters into the skin. So you're wounding right above that and thereby recruiting all of these growth factors from the stem cell bulge itself without actually damaging the bulge. So these comparative studies demonstrate that one to 1.5 millimeters for those rollers tend to be the best needle length. Mm. And beyond that, if you're using an automated pen, all of those variables we just talked about are controlled for. So you can just set it to anything between 0.6 to 0.8 millimeters. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's one of the things you were looking at. And, and this, this wound healing process, I mean, uh, and the low level, and there's a lot of things like I have extracorporeal shockwave therapy in my office, right? Which is a, uh, sends sound waves into the body and it breaks up adhesions and it causes microinflammation. And 
Yeah, and it's been shown to actually regrow a collagen, right? So I have knees now, you know, the research shows reduction in osteophytes, new collagen, new even new cartilage between the cartilage and the bone, the subchondral. Um, and it's mm. fascinating, right? I wonder, I mean, there just seems like this is just an open field of investigation. I wonder, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll do a search on shockwave therapy and hair loss. I wonder if they're doing anything out there. It seems like it would be amazing. So one of the suspected rate limiting regrowth factors for androgenic alopecia happens to be parafollicular fibrosis, which is also known as scarring that forms around the hair follicles themselves. So with these microneedling devices purportedly, what they're believed to do at the hair follicle sites is they're believed to initiate new growth stages of the hair follicle itself. So you mm -hmm. turn more hairs on into growing versus resting. But another purported mechanism, because we've seen it in acne patients with repeated microneedling to the face, is that with those same exact needle lengths, sometimes even shorter, you can remodel a lot of skin that's already scarred. And so these hair follicles that are constrained by scar tissue now have the opportunity to resize as larger in their subsequent hair cycle Ugh. because that scar tissue has broken down and a lot of it has been replaced with these perfectly aligned uh, cross hassings of new collagen. Mm, phenomenal. So that would be, so then, uh, you know, I think what my, my buddy went through is the, the massage. The massage techniques would be amazing also, right? And I think the, the, one of the things he was doing is, is pushing hard together, you know, and you say, make it hurt, right? Getting the nails in and pushing that skin together and feeling. And he'd be like, oh, I feel, I feel something here. And then it'll be like, you know, a few days later, we'd say, oh, that's kind of freed up. And now I'm feeling, now I, I'm working on this area. And I think what you're saying is probably the fibrosis. Yes, it's possible. There's a, ton of different elements involved in evolving scalp that we can talk about right now or even later on when we're chatting i mean so what are they so you, you talk about the causes of 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 hair loss and you talk about this um de dehydrotestosterone and um and some environmental factors like you know we we want to know what what do i have power over right what can i how can i take control of of my situation you know absolutely so um so First of all, to address the comments about scalp massaging. So in 2013, there was this study that came out really, really low quality in a journal that is not reputable, uh, talking about these scalp massages potentially working for pattern hair loss. And I looked at the study, it looked kind of ridiculous, but I also was looking at all these mechanistic points of evidence with mechanotransduction and mechanical stimulation based therapies. And I was looking at PRP outcomes and I was looking mm. at massaging and microneedling and how you could use massages in clinical studies to attenuate the fibrosis that would onset after burns. Mm. Individuals who would get burned could use cyclical based massages to help lower the amount of scar tissue that would form. And I looked at the histological and morphological features of a balding scalp and I thought, well, maybe this study has some merit to it. And so I started to perform these exercises. And because this was at a time where I was really focused on my hair and I didn't have any larger responsibilities aside from <laughs> maintaining employment and uh, rent and everything else, I was massaging my scalp for like two plus hours daily. Oh my. And I was focusing specifically on acute inflammation generation across the top of the scalp. Mm -hmm. And then I was also focusing on relaxing these muscles that surround the scalp perimeter that in about 80% of men suffering from androgenic alopecia for unknown reasons are chronically and involuntarily contracted, at least to a low degree. Interesting. And so targeting those two things happened to be what helped me improve my hair loss outcomes. And so I, that really excited me. I ended up dropping minoxidil, dropping the supplements, dropping the low-level laser therapy devices, just sticking with massaging and experiencing maintenance beyond that after even seeing some improvements. And that's what led to the start of perfecthairhealth.com. So I just started a donation-based website, made a video on how to do the massages, wrote a PDF on the suspected mechanisms and said, anybody wants this, it's free or you can donate. And the site remained that way for many years. And we just accumulated all these different success stories from people who had similar stories or who had some waverings about the FDA approved drug approach and who wanted to try something that was innate to themselves without reliance on supplements and topicals. And so the site now has changed a lot because I love working with people who want to take the natural approach, 
But I don't necessarily think that that's the only way to go. And unfortunately, a lot of these natural interventions, they rank lower on the hierarchy of evidence. So they don't have the statistical power behind them. They don't have these massive randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trials comparing the intervention that's natural, like saw palmetto, for example, which is a natural DHT reducer, mm. against finasteride, against a placebo group, against an untreated group with 2,000 people in every arm. You just don't get that statistical right. level of power with natural interventions. So lower quality of evidence, but then again, the absence of evidence doesn't mean that that's evidenced against any intervention. Right. It just means that it's lesser supported. And so our site became a communication hub and an educational resource and a consumer advocacy group really to ensure that people who wanted to try the natural interventions were given the best of the best information and options that they could adhere to with specific timeframes built around their needs and preferences. And on top of that, for people who wanted to use the drug approaches or who were on the fence, we do our best to make sure that they're not exposed to misinformation. Like I was back in 2007 when I typed in finasteride side effects online and just ran into all these horror stories because finasteride is one of those drugs that suffers from what's known as the Yelp effect. So you, uh, you're more likely to rate a restaurant negatively uh, where you've had a terrible experience versus a positive experience. So think of all the restaurants that you've sure. been to um, that you've had a wonderful experience at uh, that you never decided to leave a five-star review for. Well, now think of the three or four that you've went to that were terrible. Mm. The odds of you leaving that negative review versus that positive review, it's a big discrepancy there in terms of the incidence of exposure to negativity and the amount of times that people want to talk about it. So with the anonymity of hair loss forums and with these other um, websites that I was reading, especially natural websites, uh, I just got so scared of these things. I didn't read, know how to read these clinical trials yet. And so this podcast, well, I would love to talk a ton about the natural interventions, the scalp massages. I also don't want to dissuade anybody from having an interest in these drugs. It's important to understand the literature. It's important to understand the side effect profiles. Mm -hmm. They work really easily. And I have to tell you that taking a pill or applying a topical every day, is way easier than dedicating a, an hour or yes. so to massaging your scalp. Yes, for um, sure. So is it really you need to weigh hour? these things. Is, is it an hour? It's not an hour. So in 2016, we standardized the scalp massage techniques based off the best of the best responders who had submitted photos to us. We decided we're gonna standardize these into specific scalp segments, scalp pinching, pressing, and stretching exercises and rotations, and then we're gonna ascribe two times 20 minutes daily, knowing full well that most people are not going to adhere to that level. Mm -hmm. We're gonna launch a survey study to find out the perceptions of hair change over time for individuals who try these therapies. Beautiful. So in 2017, we started that study. 2018, 2019, we were collecting data, and we ended up publishing in early 2019, and there seemed to be this time-dependent effect on scalp massages, the minutes daily times the months of adherence, mm -hmm. and the effects on self-perceived hair changes. So again, survey data, not the highest quality, but it's something. Right. And uh, what we saw is that with more time accumulated with these massages, people saw great outcomes and people reported great outcomes. And we had some people submit before and after photos of those outcomes in that study itself. Mm. So what we also found encouragingly was that people who were doing zero to 10 minutes daily still had a positive effect so long as they just did this consistently enough. Regularly. And people who were doing 11 minutes to 20 minutes daily still had a positive effect. Mm. And yes, the massages became more effective and more efficient with more mm. minutes of dedication, but it wasn't necessary. You could mm -hmm. get away with 20 minute sessions. In fact, there's some people that we work with now who know full well that there's absolutely no way that they're gonna be able to do these massages every single day or even twice a day. And that's right. totally fine. So they anchor their massage sessions to a Netflix show that they're watching. And they do a 45 minute session Monday, 45 minute session Friday, 45 minute session uh, Sunday, or they do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just three times a week. And that's it. And it works for them. So there's a lot of different ways to cross the finish line when you're leveraging these acute inflammation tactics and these uh, muscle relaxation tactics. Again, not the same quality of evidence. Big right. disclaimer. Right. Um, Question but is, they is, can do something. What about like, um, you know, obviously the hands, you know, I work with my hands, I can get a little tired. 
Um, what about like these massagers, like uh, something you plug in, it's got a battery, it's rotating, or the tingler or something like that. I mean, did you ever throw any of that in the mix? I mean, when are you coming out with so, your product, Rob? You know? uh, we, don't <laughs> we don't sell any physical products because our concern with that is that it would bias our lens of research. So cool. a lot of times what ends up happening is these companies, they'll build a brand around a natural supplement. And then the ingredients in that supplement will bore out in later clinical trials to not be as effective as they'd hoped. Mm -hmm. And yet they still will only show you the mouse model studies that demonstrated some effect, or they'll still only show you the 10 person clinical trial that was done on their friends and family that had some effect. Right. And so you get a lot of products that are super popular out there clinging to old data, bad mm -hmm. data. So we made a decision very early on at the detriment to uh, my daughter and wife that <laughs> We were just not going to be selling any physical products and we we're going right. to stick to the academic side and publish papers and work uh, on scholarly journals. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's been the the modus operandi of the site since then. Mm -hmm. um, but we got no products coming out. To answer your question, a lot of people have innovated with different scalp massage devices. So mm -hmm. you have people who have used these four pronged things that you can buy, these Panasonic massagers off of Amazon. Right. There was even a very, very tiny clinical study on that on uh, 10 Japanese men who were non-balding, but over a six month period of massaging one side of their scalp with these four pronged Panasonic massagers had a 10% increase in hair thickness overall versus the other side of their scalp. Oh, so it seems amazing. like, so yeah, it's, you know, that's good to hear. So, yeah. So they're yeah. spending like 10 minutes a day with this little, this little vibration massager, your the rotational massager on one side of their head and they get 10% more hair on one side. In that study it was four minutes daily. So it wasn't even that massive of a commitment. Now we can't necessarily think that, four minutes, 10% increase, 40 minutes, 100% increase. There's a, a non-linearity to the improvements that you tend to see with wound healing exercises. And we don't quite fully understand how they work yet. And they seem to work really well for some people and they seem to not necessarily be as effective for others. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in any case, there are these devices and we even had a member, a part of our membership community. He, um, he found that the massages that we were recommending were hurting his hands. And so he, uh, he developed these wooden tools to help do these cyclical based presses and stretches to get the skin to fold in a way that he wanted. He saw great outcomes. And then we contracted with him to make tons of tools and we just give them away for free for people who want to try them inside of the community now. Oh, that's beautiful. So it seems like we're, we, we've got a little movement in this area. It seems like there's some knowledge coming out. There's some clarity here. It looks like, um, I mean, you can't promise anything, of course, but um, it looks like some real evidence here. Really low quality evidence, but it's all preliminary and these are how things start. So how far will this go? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Will massages be a, a staple treatment for androgenic alopecia? Probably not. They're incredibly time intensive. And uh, there are certainly other modalities out there like the FDA approved drugs that can consistently produce results at a much higher rate. But for our study, the people who made it eight plus months of massaging or longer at any minutes daily combination, 75% of them reported either hair loss stabilization, meaning they were able to completely stop the progression mm -hmm. of their condition or some degree of hair regrowth, with that hair regrowth varying depending on the individual. That's beautiful. Those are great odds. Why not? I mean, like you said, just link it on to something else. Okay, I watch the news or I'm, I, you know, I don't know, I'm pumping gas or I'm, I'm talking on the phone, you know, with, with my mom and put her on speaker or whatever it is. We all have a little time every day, you know, and if you have a yeah. massager, it doesn't seem that difficult. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And the, the mechanisms are interesting. So we know from these microneedling studies that when you're combining microneedling with these other drugs, there's significant improvements to hair counts, 30%, mm. 40%, and some hair thickening as well. So the density improvements can be pretty substantial, especially when you're using it with 5% minoxidil. But in the control groups of these studies that are just microneedling by themselves, you see a 10 to 15% increase in terminal hair counts. And it's oh. all through this wound healing. When you look at PRP, platelet-rich plasma therapy, where you 
take some blood, centrifuge it, separate out the plasma, and then inject that plasma directly into the intradermal layers of balding tissues. Right. In those cases, 10 to 30% increases to hair counts overall for most clinical studies exploring that modality. Mm -hmm. So you think, can you leverage this from a pathway that might just elicit the use of your hands or some sort of device right. that's cost effective? And um, it I seems had a, like maybe I, there, there is. I had a podcast with Dr. Josh Donaldson. Here's a shameless plug. Uh, you know, that you can watch that and hear all about PRP. And he does go into that. Uh, and the PRP facials with the with the with the micro needling on the face, et cetera, to help with collagen. Um, but what about like how often are you? How much are people using this? You said use it at one to one point five millimeters uh, in in the length, and these are available what on Amazon for twenty bucks. I mean, this is not a high end product. Um, I think they're titanium. But how how often are you using this? Is this a once a week for eight week thing? So. The clinical data on these microneedling devices, you're catching me at a really good time because we just published that systematic review. I love it. Um, Go with it. The, the clinical data on these microneedling devices are of relatively lower quality. So if you were to assign JADAD scores for a clinical trial, zero through five is the possibilities. Most microneedling studies out there are ranging from zero to three. So that's on the lower end of quality for these studies. Okay. Again, this is how it usually works with anything that's non-pharmaceutical. Right. Um, so with that disclaimer, what we're seeing is that there have been these meta-analyses done where people have pooled these subgroups together of microneedling only treatment arms in different clinical trials. They pool those together to improve their statistical uh, uh, power. And then they compare the hair count outcomes observed there against something like 5% minoxidil in the same treatment arms or the same treatment studies in a different arm. What we're seeing is that in some of these regression models, the microneedling is as effective as 5% minoxidil, if not more effective at improving hair counts. Mm. The combination of the two is the most powerful of all. But the element to answer your question is that the more often you seem to do this according to these regression models, the better your results. Mm. So in those studies, you had frequencies once every four weeks, every three weeks, every two weeks, every one week. Every one week was getting the best results. They were. And how studies. long were they going? Yeah. So you look at the session endpoints, it different across it, it differed across investigation groups. Some people did it until they saw pinpoint bleeding. Some people benchmarked it to a set time, 25 minutes, 45 minutes. And Whoa. Some of these sessions were absolutely brutal. Oh. Um so, yeah, some people benchmarked it to a number of passes. So eight passes up, eight passes horizontally eight passes diagonally, eight mm -hmm. passes the other way diagonally. And then you'd move on to the next section of the scalp. So there's a, a lot of different ways that these researchers benchmark these things. In my opinion, I think you have to go at least 10, 15 minutes to really elicit the level and degree of inflammation required to have a significant effect. But by the next day, your scalp should feel relatively recovered. You don't want to beat the crap out of your scalp here and have it be weeks before you feel normal again. Um, and obviously be careful and talk to your doctor before doing any wound be, uh, wounding based therapy. Right, right. Then if you throw a low level, level laser on there, or maybe you get in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, or you're doing other things that help with wound healing, you could probably get a compound effect. Possibly. So there have been no comparative studies or um, combination studies on microneedling plus LLT or microneedling plus hyperbaric oxygen chamber therapy or PRP. Um, but what we have seen is that microneedling by itself can basically elicit the same hair count outcomes as platelet rich plasma. And it's because both therapies use the same mechanisms. PRP costs somewhere around $1,200 to $1,600 a session in the US. You got to do it for a mm -hmm. lifetime every three months or so. Results are contingent upon their use. These microneedling devices are 10 to 20 bucks. Um, so we don't yet know the amplification effects of microneedling with the, the, the modalities that you just mentioned, but we do know that it pairs really powerfully with FDA approved drugs like minoxidil mm -hmm. or finasteride or for women, things like spironolactone or oral contraceptives, even for people who have plateaued using hair loss drugs, you start to use microneedling, the clinical evidence turns that slope upward again. So it's mm. like you can unlock a new level of growth. To your point, 
probably because in many of these cases, you're targeting different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. What are we finding that's, that's, um, you know, your, your, your person that, what, what variables are we seeing for people that are losing their hair? Like, what are we, what are we doing wrong environmentally or what type of person, or is there something I'm putting on my hair? We're putting on our hair. Okay. This is definitely, this is petroleum product. This is not good. It's clogging my pores. Is there anything that, that, what not to do? There's plenty not to do, uh, <laughs> but uh, there's a there's a couple of big things that people should know about hair loss um, that probably would help to guide this part of the conversation. So, if you're an adult and you feel like your hair is thinning, um, there's a bunch of different possibilities that it could be. It could be androgenic alopecia. It could be telogen effluvium. It could be an autoimmune type of hair loss like alopecia areata or a scarring alopecia, cicatracial alopecia. Um, you could be losing your hair because your ponytail might be too tight. You can be losing your traction hair because alopecia. you have a demodex infection. That one, right? Traction alopecia. What's that? If that one's traction, traction alopecia. Yes, traction exactly. Alopecia. Right. Um, but for the overwhelming majority of people who are adults and who are otherwise normally healthy, who are noticing hair loss, the most likely diagnosis they're going to get when they go to a doctor is androgenic alopecia or male and female pattern hair loss. So. The evidence very strongly implicates that this condition is polygenic. It's a very strong genetic component. There are over 200 genes associated with the onset of androgenic alopecia, specifically surrounding the androgen receptors of cell sites. So those are kind of like the landing pads for that hormone, dihydrotestosterone or DHT. Mm. And um, really strong genetic component, but you also have to have the male hormones themselves. And it seems like the combination between genes and your lifelong total exposure to androgens, specifically type 2 5 alpha dihydrotestosterone or DHT, male pattern hair loss, female pattern hair loss, really strong evidence that there's a genetic component to this and an androgenic component to this. Mm -hmm. Um, I can even give you some of the history there because it's kind of fascinating. So, but the interesting, back. Th I, I want to know the history, but it's it's interesting because we're talking about warrant healing, we're talking about inflammation, we're talking about stimulating that healing process, right? But then we're talking about gene expression and hormones. The, the, the treatments that we're talking about aren't matching what you're saying the causes are, right? In some cases, yes. So, even though we know that minoxidil doesn't work through hormonal pathways. When you look at five-year study outcomes on, on minoxidil, year one, the hair counts are highest, and then they start to slope downward a little bit. Mm. But when you measure at year five, you're still way above baseline, despite not targeting this hormone DHT directly using this topical agent Got that it. for about 50% of people works and can work for the long term. So there are these elements of hair loss pathology that we don't yet quite fully understand. And a lot of them relate to the androgen receptor itself, the WNT pathway, the beta catenin pathway. So there are these elements that we don't fully get yet. Um, so to your point, you're absolutely right. Some of these non-hormonal therapies, low-level laser therapy, PRP, microneedling, even to a degree the lower evidence supporting something like scalp massaging, this might not work purportedly through targeting the hormones themselves, mm -hmm. but they seem to be working for at least a percentage of the individuals that are trying them. And in our case, 75% who made it to that eight month mark or longer. So the, the evidence though on, on this one hormone specifically being involved in male pattern hair loss is very, very strong. Um, in the 1940s, there was this doctor, Dr. Hamilton, and he was doing these observational studies on male castrates. Uh, so men who had been castrated before puberty, whereby they'd lose 95% of their ability to produce testosterone over a lifetime. And then men who were castrated after puberty and mm. thereby, you know, had testosterone exposure for some time throughout adulthood at high volumes, but then lost it for the most part. Mm -hmm. He saw that men who were castrated before puberty had a really high degree of protection against male pattern hair loss. And men who were castrated in adulthood didn't go bald anymore beyond where they had initially balded. And so that implicated very early on this possibility that, oh, well, maybe this overall male hormone might be having something to do with uh, the baldness process. Mm -hmm. You fast forward 30 years later, there were these anecdotes coming out from these guavadoches, uh, people in Guam and Papua New Guinea, these islands 
whereby some of the men on those islands were completely protected against male pattern hair loss. And they had what's known as a type 2 5 alpha reductase genetic deficiency. So a mutation in their genetic code did not allow them to produce this enzyme that converted free testosterone into type 2 5 alpha dihydrotestosterone, mm. DHT, that mm. hormone that we now know is way closer to the problem. And so people looked at this and thought, oh, that's really interesting. These men have perfectly normal testosterone levels in adulthood, no DHT, at least type 2 DHT, no baldness. Mm. And then they started to look into drugs in the 1980s that targeted type 2 5-alpha reductase. And that is what finasteride does. It's a type 2 5-alpha oh. reductase inhibitor. So it dampens your body's production of 5-alpha reductase. That's the enzyme that turns testosterone into DHT. DHT. They were noticing that in clinical trials, if you reduce that uh, conversion by about 60 to 70%, you can lower DHT levels in the body and in the scalp. You can end up stopping pattern hair loss for 80 to 90% of guys. And then over a two-year period, see a 10 to 15% increase in hair counts. But a 10 to 30% increase in hair thickness overall. And so the volume of hair was much improved over these two year study outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then later on, these studies came out in vitro in cell cultures where they bathed this uh, uh, a balding prone hair follicle in testosterone that had started miniaturizing. And they would notice, oh wow, look, this, this follicle, when you expose it to DHT in a cell culture, it starts to undergo apoptosis, it starts to undergo damage. And so there's this really concrete evidence at an observational level, at a mechanistic level, and at an interventional level that directly implicates this hormone, DHT, as at least one of the causative agents in male pattern hair loss. Mm -hmm. Now, is it the only thing that's going on? Absolutely not. There's a ton of other things going on. Um, but the evidence very strongly leans toward that hormone being a very effective target for most people. And so when you look at the data on finasteride, these really large, well-controlled clinical trials, a lot of men who are in those trials see significant hair growth against placebo and untreated groups, mm. and they maintain it for very long periods of time. So it's usually the option that most guys want to go to if they're comfortable lowering that hormone in adulthood. Um, one of the consequences of lowering that hormone is that your testosterone actually increases about 15 to 20 percent. Because so you're not converting. You lower it. DHT, there's this yin and yang effect whereby your testosterone bumps up because now less free testosterone is converting to DHT. It now binds to sex hormone binding globulin and albumin becomes total testosterone. So what are the negative consequences or long-term studies on, on that? So there are a few side effects that you would absolutely want to watch out for when you're inhibiting type 2 5 alpha reductase. Yeah. Um, and my lacking understanding around the relative risk profile for most people taking this drug is why I avoided it. I don't use it today. I'm way more open than ever to using it now. But for between 2 to 15% of people in well-controlled clinical trials, there is some sort of side effect reported. And usually those side effects are related to sexual reductions, libido reductions, sexual dysfunction, things like that. Um, there can also be some sperm parameter changes as well in individuals taking finasteride that seem to happen temporarily and then level out and improve at the year mark. So it's one of these things that you have to take for life. It's a decision that if you want to keep your hair through the drug modalities, you should talk to your doctor, think about what the pros and cons are of using it. Right. But it's a drug that's been studied for 30 plus years. Mm. 40,000 plus individuals across dozens and dozens and dozens of clinical trials. Um, it's relatively safe for people who are apprehensive about using the oral formulations and reducing DHT everywhere. There's topical applications as mm. well. Mm. Um, and most people focus on the, the negative side effects of finasteride. They absolutely do exist. I would never want to discount them. But there's a bell curve for side effects with finasteride as well. Mm -hmm. So... There's actually a, a cohort of individuals who report sexual enhancement from oh, finasteride, right. which is wild. So most Maybe of them are just feeling being... more sexy because they have great hair. You know, whereas the <laughs> other guys have great hair, but they can't show up. <laughs> the plot thickens, though, because 
the cluster surrounds people who are left-handed versus right-handed. <laughs> so there seems to be neurosteroid pathways in right-handed versus left-handed individuals, differentials in the neurosteroid activity of that type of enzyme itself in the brain that might be explaining why there might be this bell curve for side effects. Mm. The other thing too that to, to think about is that saw palmetto is considered nature's finasteride because it's also a type 2, 5 alpha reductase inhibitor and it's derived from the Serenoa repens plant that grows like weeds down in Florida. In European, uh, in European and Caucasian populations, if you look at all the data on saw palmetto, very, very low risk of side effects overall. It doesn't reduce that hormone DHT as effectively as finasteride, but it still gets you somewhere. And it can have a cessation effect on individuals using it for male pattern hair loss. But occasionally, when you pull like tens of thousands of people together, you'll get a handful that reports some reductions to libido in these European and Caucasian populations. So consistency of an effect mm. with finasteride. You switch your population base over to Native Americans. Historically, salt palmetto was used as, as an aphrodisiac. Oh, so our understandings around this enzyme are, we got a lot to learn basically. Lot to but learn. Yeah. with the data so far in adults, most people using finasteride report great outcomes. Um, you, could, you could scare somebody into saying that the side effect risk is 2% by looking at one study and another study, it can say the side effect risk is 40%. It depends on the quality of the study. It depends on the way that you ask the questions when building the side effect questionnaire. You can, you can ask leading questions mm. that both dissuade people from reporting side effects and encourage people to mm. think they need to report a side effect. And on top of that, um, just the psychosomatic component of the drug as well. So right. I think uh, there was a study that was done where physicians prescribed finasteride and said, hey, this drug might cause side effects, have mm. fun. And then there was another group that just gave patients the drug. Fascinating. In uh, the patient cohort that was told the drug might cause side effects, 500% increase in reported risk yeah, of side effects. Wow. So yeah, I mean, there's a psychosomatic component to this too, but even controlling for that, the side effects absolutely are there. They do exist, but it is the best study drug that we've got. And for people who are worried about those side effects, you can dramatically reduce your risk by going with a topical because mm -hmm. the topical when formulated properly will have some systemic leakage, but you'll preserve for the most part, DHT levels and 5-alpha reductase activity in the rest of your body. body. Yep. You right. just isolate okay. it right to the scalp. So I'm a placebo reactor. I mean, I'm just a feeler, right? And you know, you tell me it's good. I'm going to feel it before I even take it. Um, but let's let's get real for a second. You're the guy. You 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 have peer-reviewed scientific articles. You're you, you're editing scientific articles. You're you et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing? And do you mind me asking? What are you doing for your hair? I don't mind at all. I mean, I you're still do like the massages. I still do microneedling. Yeah. You still do microneedling. Okay. <laughs> still do microneedling, still do the massages. Plan on continuing to do those for as long as I can. Danielle and I are trying to figure out if we're going to have a second child this year. And if we do, I would love to take a break from those hand-based massages and start something like a micro dose of oral finasteride or topical finasteride because uh, – there's something that can get a little bit tiring when you've got a couple gremlins running around and uh, all of a sudden the end of how your day often, doesn't though? have how as much energy. Do, how, how much time are you spending every day? Usually a few times a week, a uh, deeper session. So I'll go for 45 minutes, just like we talked about earlier, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Wow. Wow. But it's easy when you anchor that to a, a show that you're watching. True. You anchor that to a show that you're watching after everybody goes to bed. It's just a routine that you do. It feels nice. You feel relaxed. It's easier to fall asleep that night, at least for me. Um, and it's one of these things where for some individuals, it might really help. For others, it might help to enhance the response to certain drugs. Right. We just don't know because we don't have the strong, concrete data. So I don't want to overstate any of those I claims. Find, I find, you know, because I'm, I'm big, right? I'm from the neck up big time on my YouTube channel. I'm getting people to do massages on themselves all day, every day. Um, from eustachian tube dysfunction to sinus problems to uh, eye strain, etc. And so I started doing some of this stuff on the scalp. And it's, you don't want to do it right before you have to go in and you know do a podcast because your hair is going to look like you know 
whatever, and uh, Chewbacca. But, uh, but anyway, so I found that my eyes were more relaxed. I found that my ears felt a little more life in them. I feel it's, it, I think there's a lot of collateral benefit here. Um, and then I haven't tried the massager thing. I got it from my buddy. Um, you know, I don't know if he's using it, but I got it for, you know, the kids gave it to him for Christmas or whatever. And, um, but I, I think it would be an interesting thing to do too. But I, I, I'm this one, this skin rolling thing. And I have, I have people do skin rolling like crazy on like if they've had, um, abdominal surgery or something like that, or they have trigger points in their abdominal muscles, like their psoas or whatever, I'll have them roll their skin so then they can go in deeper. And, um, that seems to be one of the techniques you, you espouse. And, and I think it's, I think it's, I, I mean, I just feel good after it. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about the acute inflammation side of the massages, but there's this other element too, that you're alluding to, and it's about the muscle relaxation effects. So there is this band of muscles that surrounds the entire scalp perimeter. And then that, that band of muscle is anchored to this tissue called the Golea aponeurotica, which underlies balding prone regions for most individuals. So it wraps all the way across the scalp. There's no muscle at the top of the scalp, but there's this muscle band that is connected to that dense fibrous like membrane, the Galea aponeurotica surrounding the scalp perimeter. So if you talk to a dermatologist who's really familiar with examining people's scalps, they'll tell you about 80% of guys and females as well facing androgenic alopecia have these tighter scalps. And the question mm -hmm. is always that a cause of the baldness or is it a consequence of the baldness? Mm -hmm. We just don't know. Well, in the 2000s, this doctor, university lecturer up in Toronto, uh, Dr. Brian Frund was exploring using Botox to help treat chronic tension headaches. So he was mm. this researcher and university lecturer who was internationally renowned as an expert in botulinum toxin or Botox, which is a muscle relaxant. And he had all these patients complaining of tension headaches and he wanted to try and inject Botox into the scalp perimeter muscles to see if it would help improve their hair count, or sorry, not their hair counts, but their headaches overall. And so to initially test this, he and his business partner injected themselves with botulinum toxin, mm -hmm. noticed that their own tension headaches were improving, but they also reported independently that they had noticed way less shedding on their pillow at night and that some of their hair started to grow back again. They both had been dealing with male pattern hair loss. And so they ended up reaching out to the manufacturers of Botox, setting up a clinical trial to test Botox injections into the scalp perimeter of men with androgenic alopecia. And they ended up recruiting 50 individuals. They did a 10 month window for study. They did uh, one injection round at month zero and another injection round at month five, 100 to 150 units of Botox all around the scalp perimeter to completely make sure that these muscles were relaxed. And then Botox effects usually last for four to six months. They came back for another round, did another round of injections. And they got very specific with the way that they wanted to design the study. So they actually tattooed freckles at the top of their scalps here near the crown. And they wanted to measure before and after the hair changes in those areas. So they used a device called a phototrichogram and they used software to count the hairs before mm -hmm. and after. They reached the end of that 10 month period and on average, 75% of people in that study responded favorably to Botox, meaning they saw a stop or regrowth in hair. And of everybody included in the study, non-responders and responders, an average increase in hair count of 18%. And so they published that research. You can get botulinum toxin injections into your scalp perimeter if you want, um, but it tends to implicate the contraction of these muscles possibly in the mm. progression of male pattern hair loss and maybe even female pattern hair loss. Mm -hmm. And so why might that be? Why might botulinum toxin into the scalp muscles here relax these muscles and lead to improvements to hair count? It's, well, constricting, anatomy, it's constricting blood vessels, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one purported mechanism. So um, when you look at the anatomy of the scalp, you have such a dense vascularized regions of scalp tissue all across here with, with, with uh, arteries and blood vessels kind of running in every different direction. Um, but you also have intersection points with the muscle groups here. 
So if you look at the supratrochlear and the supraorbital artery, these come from the internal carotid artery inside the skull. They poke through the skull bone, they go over your eyebrows, and then they go right underneath the frontalis muscles here. Mm -hmm. And then they pierce through the frontalis muscles, and then they supply the top region of your scalp predominantly with blood supply, along with the superficial temporal artery that runs right here. So when those muscles clamp down, the frontalis muscles clamp down, you're literally pinching two of the three arterial branches that are predominantly supplying the front third of the scalp with, mm -hmm. with blood and oxygen. Mm -hmm. Now, just knocking out one of those is not going to be that big of a deal because the scalp has anastomus, meaning that all of these arterial networks are mostly intertwined. But you begin to look at other arterial networks like the auricularis anterior and posterior those interweave with the muscles as well and the tendons surrounding the muscles. In addition to that, the deep temporal artery actually rests against the pericranium underneath these muscles here. And so when those muscles contract, they press that deep temporal artery against mm. the skull bone itself. Mm. When that's chronic and, and consistent, you're going to be dealing with some restriction to blood supply that in the long term could be problematic. I wonder if people who are chronic bruxers, if people that uh, clinch their teeth, right? They have tight temporalis muscles, tight masseter muscles. I wonder if they might be more prone to baldness. It's a good question. We just, we don't know, but it's possible. Right. Um, and then the superficial artery, the superficial temporal artery, it's this huge artery that runs above the muscles themselves. So you would think, oh, a lot of these arterial branches are resting above the muscle in the fascia. Why would these things have any impact on the muscles themselves? If it's a blood supply issue and you, you, the muscles are here, then anything above the muscle, that can't be involved, right? Well, not so fast. Chronic tension headaches have demonstrated that when these muscles contract, the superficial temporal artery constricts by 50%. And if you do the math, for the reduction to blood supply from that constriction above the muscle itself, you end up with a 75% redu reduction to blood and oxygen from the contraction of those muscles themselves. So you have what might be some evidence to suggest that these relaxation efforts from Botox could be one of these things that help to improve blood supply to the top of the scalp. And maybe that could have an effect on hair counts, maybe hair diameters overall. We just don't know. So it's all speculative. Um, the challenge with all of this is that male pattern hair loss is absolutely associated with reductions to blood flow and oxygen levels. So there have been studies uh, demonstrating that balding regions have about 40% less transcutaneous oxygen. There have mm -hmm. also been studies to demonstrate that balding scalps overall have 2.6 less times the amount of blood flow as non-balding scalps. So we mm -hmm. see these massive reductions to blood and oxygen. Mm -hmm. But the complication is that nobody is quite sure yet how much of that is attributable to the anatomical structures and the contraction of these scalp perimeter muscles, mm -hmm. pinching off certain vascular networks, forcing vaso, uh, vasoconstriction, mm -hmm. or whether it's a consequence of hair cycling and miniaturization. So the big defining characteristic of male pattern hair loss, aside from the temple recession and the bald spot that guys get and then the slick bald scalp, the way that this condition actually progresses is through hair follicle miniaturization. So the hairs get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner mm -hmm. over time. But if you plucked a hair that was, that was suffering from male pattern hair loss and you measured it from the root all the way to the tip, it's the same exact thickness. It's the same exact diameter. So these hairs, we know that they don't actively miniaturize as they're growing. So when does it happen? It happens through hair cycling. So the hairs shed out, the old follicle collapses, a new follicle comes in to take its place, but the action of that hormone DHT damages the base of the follicle mm. and it takes its sizing from this big in the last hair cycle down to this big. Mm. And that precipitates less of a need for blood supply. And so the question has always been, is this cycling of reductions driven by DHT of miniaturization, is that driving a reduced blood supply and it's a consequence of the balding process? Or 
is there some anatomical or extraneous factor driving some reductions to blood and oxygen? Right. We also know in mouse models that if you basically create an ischemic tissue or uh, uh, a tissue that is not hyperoxygenated, it's lacking oxygen, you see miniaturization happen to the hair follicles. Mm. So we know that we can force miniaturization through reductions to blood and oxygen. Mm -hmm. We just don't know if what we're seeing in a balding scalp is because of that. So the mechanisms behind these Botox studies, they're still disputed. We don't yet know. But the nice thing is, regardless, if they happen to involve the actual muscles themselves, we can use our hands to basically do the same exercises and 18 save ourselves percent a lot more, of money. Yeah, thickness. We love it. How often are you yeah. doing your, your microneedling? Once every few weeks. So I've week. gone through stints where I do it consistently once weekly, sometimes once every other week. Right now, it's about once every three weeks to once a month. Mm -hmm. And then Your hair usually thick. every few months, I'll fall off the bandwagon and right. then I'll get back on. And you use a, like a 1.5? Yeah, I use a roller, 1.5 millimeters. But I'm a total baby. I wince. It's so painful. I never look forward to it. You don't use like a topical analgesic or anything like that? No, no, I haven't. Okay. Yeah, they're out there. Yeah. You know, benzo, <laughs> lidocaine, tetracaine, you know, all of it. But you just... do you use one of those? Uh, no, I had a, uh, I was getting PRP injections in my shoulder and I, and I just would bathe it. I would just put it on there and I just, it was so much better. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I don't think you have to. So you asked the question earlier, and I didn't, I didn't quite answer it, but it was about how, um, you know, we talked a lot about DHT and male hormones and their involvement along with genetics for androgenic alopecia. But you asked, a, you asked a question about the environmental factors as well. Yeah, and, yeah um, I mean, because, you know what I think we should do because this is so fascinating. I would just love to have you on again, and we can talk in environmental fa factors. And I would love to get into a little bit of the gray hair aspect, which would be interesting. You're not there yet, but I'm, I'm starting on the gray hair track. And I would love to, you know, I'm, I'm Googling and looking and, um, you know, certain oils and, you know, I'm barking at the moon and throwing sand and pre figuring out how to get this thing to go from gray to dark. But uh, that would be great. I mean, would you mind coming on again? Yeah, I would love to. I okay. mean, we uh, we've only scratched the surface of uh, one <laughs> one basic intervention and then one pharmaceutical route as well. So I, I would like love it. to chat more because there's a there's a lot of lifestyle and dietary things that you can do to slow down the progression of male pattern hair loss or take okay. it out of a state of acceleration. Um, those are absolutely important to cover. So um, while this condition, if you're dealing with it, it's not your fault, um, and it's certainly genetically and androgenically determined, there are ways to really ramp up its acceleration with poor dietary choices, poor lifestyles, poor environments. Right. And genes get turned on and off. There's, you know, gene expression and then there's genes. You know, I mean, it's just like, just because you have a gene for breast cancer doesn't mean you're going to get breast cancer. Yeah, I mean, things are determined. You know, there's a gun and then there's pointing it and shooting it, pulling the trigger. There's the environmental factors are often pulling the trigger. I can give you a crazy example of that. There was this case report of a in, that occurred in 1986 of a 78 year old bald man who was asleep in his rocking chair. He'd been bald for something like 30 years, fell asleep, leaned backwards, fell out of his chair, hit his head on his fireplace and burned his scalp on all of the hot coals, came mm. in with full thickness burns to the hospital. He was a bit of a curmudgeon, so he refused to be treated. So they had to send him home as an outpatient six months later he came back and he had accidentally regrown his entire juvenile hairline uh, so just a crazy amount of regrowth through an accidental burn and this has happened a few other times in history uh, obviously the most often outcome with a burn like that is there's just scar tissue right so right. what made this individual different that's what research groups have been wondering for over two decades now well, three let's, decades. let's dig into that more i've also heard um, people with cancer, they lose their hair and it comes back darker, uh, a different color, that type of thing, fuller. Yeah. I mean, things like this are happening and you are delving into them. It sounds like an open field um, and there's more research to be done. And I really appreciate your time. Um, hey, you guys. Um, thank you, Rob. Again, this has just been oh, amazing. And you're deep. You're interesting. And you didn't even major in biology. I love it. That's so great. You're just a thinker. <laughs> no. you know, that's kind of Silicon Valley. It's how we do it here. It's like, 
Um, was he good for this role? No, but he's a thinker. Okay, we'll put him in there, you know, and that's, that's <laughs> you've stepped up. You're just a, a, a curious intellectual guy. Thank you. It's been just a joy and we're hooking up in the next week or two. Let's do it. I'd love to. And uh, thanks for your time and thanks for giving me a chance to chat. I hope that your viewers enjoy this and get something out of it. Oh, we will. We will. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Like, share, enjoy, and keep taking care of yourself. We'll keep feeding you good information uh, like Rob. Take care.